Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about some of the frontiers of recurrent nets, but first I wanted to give my personal sort of view on um, and a bit of like what's, what's been going on in the last few years. Uh, and I'm, I'm describing a lot of work, obviously, with lots of people, collaborators, and also many other people in the research community. So I get to attend many talks from Jürgen, and uh, he said once that Google will so soon be a big LSTM. Um, it hasn't quite happened, and it's not only LSTMs, but it is true that at Google, uh, many, many uh, projects and, and products are being affected by deep learning nowadays. Um, also, that sort of tells you the, the sort of impact that all the research that we do um, has uh, to like products in companies and also to everyone's lives, I guess. Um, so, but going a bit to research, like we, we've gotten to a state where more or less uh, when you kind of start working on a, a new task, uh, you're faced with all sorts of different toolbox components that you can mix and match um, to fit your particular needs uh, for the task you, you need to solve. So um, this is non-exhaustive, non but mostly biased towards uh, recurrent nets and a bit of deep learning as well. And I mean, to name a few here, there's obviously sequences have become now, now kind of a cool thing to work on and something we can actually get our hands on and solve real problems. Um, there's very interesting work, um, like Jason was saying, on key value in memory networks and memory networks, uh, architectures, and so on. Um, there's also just the core recurrent architectures are changing and are new additions like um, you know, adapting computation time. Obviously, LSTMs were one of the first sort of innovations in this area and so on and so forth. Um, there's also important things to be done in temporal hierarchies where the, the the signal is very far uh, away in the past. Um, so clockwork RNN was an example and other, other sorts of models that I think now we'll, we'll explain a bit later today as well. Um, but at the end of the day, um, what ends up happening is you kind of mix and match these sequence encoder, decoders, attention models, and so on. And what happened this year, amazingly, by is that this actually is how Google Translate is operating um, at the user level, right? So, so some research that we did a couple of years ago um, by work by, by uh, you know, Young Hui and Mike Schuster, who, who was around here showing um, some of this work and so on, managed to put this um, sort of neural architecture to, to drive um, a lot of traffic um, in Google Translate. And indeed, if you look a little more closely and um, in, a, in a bit more technical sense, I'm not going to describe the model a lot, but you, you see like all sorts of components like encoder, decoders, attentions, and you know, your, your favorite new models, new papers come up with, with sort of maybe some, sometimes they add something uh, new to, to the toolbox. Sometimes it's just using the toolbox in creative ways and, and it's great the, the, progress we, the rate of progress we've, we've seen in the last few years. Um, so, the end result, though, was, was this, this really um, work done uh, by us, also like Montreal, Stanford, and many, many other people that work on, on neural machine translation. Um, it, is, it is really indeed th the case that we are improving largely um, on, on traditional systems that did not use deep learning uh, so heavily as the end-to-end -end models that we're seeing nowadays. So this is sort of a, a great example of perhaps quite simple architecture that, that works really well and, and it's really, really um, working, right? So another one, um, just taking a random picture unrelated to NIPS, um, <laughs> we've, we've, seen, we've seen like lots of, like so now here I'm taking a ConfNet and, and a decoder and suddenly I can say that this picture ca has a cake with a sherry on top. Um, and, 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 but, but more recently, in fact, a couple of days ago, of course, on Archive, a new paper came out uh, from, from Lou et al. that improves the results from state of the art quite significantly. Uh, and this model has all sorts of attention and it decides when to look, where to look, and so on. It's, it's really cool. I, I recommend you, like, to, if you have time, to, to scout Archive for new papers um, as much as you can. Uh, it's hard these days. Um, so this model is sort of extending um, and using and, and, and so on all these toolbox, which is sort of one of the uh, things we have nowadays, especially also with all the open source and releases that we are uh, seeing in deep learning. 
And then the last example, which, which dealt, dealt with surprisingly to me long sequences, um, namely tens of thousands, um, generating directly raw waveforms, uh, which perform as well um, or better than state of the art, in fact. Um, so these also will be probably shown later today. So is, is it, are we done? Is sequence to sequence or you know, all these models, like do they solve supervised learning? And actually, I, I don't think so. I, I think we've seen great progress on, on certain areas, for sure. Um, I think natural language processing is probably We've seen like all these like machine translation, parsing results, and so on. But understanding, it's it's unclear to me that we've gotten to a point where we can claim we understand language. Um, we've definitely done a lot of progress um, on on baby tasks. So so here I'm showing actually some of the work Jason was was referring to. Um, also some interesting work on how to deal with unknown words or words we see very rarely, which is a very key, key challenge in in natural language processing and understanding. But we still can't even generate long co or coherent text, um, not to say, obviously, a, a coherent chatbot, right, where we actually in, in integrate ourselves into it. Um, we cannot summarize or write a book with tens of thousands of words or more. Um, so I think there's interesting challenges for, obviously, our researchers and new PhDs and so on, and we are a long way to, to see progress here, and it's super exciting, I think, to see what we will come up with. Um, Another, another interesting area which, which um, I worked a little bit on and many others also have worked on, there's lots of, of related work. Um, the one I exposed me to these ideas were actually from, from Wojciech Zaremba, who did a paper called Learning to Execute. Um, and recently, this is an ICLR submission, there's a, um, an interesting approach where you use a neural network to solve an MP-complete task, but because MP-complete tasks are linear to evaluate, um, they use reinforcement learning, um, so they have this architecture to, let's say, propose a tour to solve the traveling salesman problem, and then they use reinforcement learning to give you a signal on how to update the parameters to minimize the tour length. Um, and it turns out that this thing, um, obviously, the, so here is a challenge as well. It, it, we, we, like they, they've tried on 100 cities, um, but it actually works better than some of the handcrafted algorithms um, here. Lower is better, right? So optimal is 7.77, and this, this method that they proposed really is at least as good as some of the heuristics, and it's learned with machine learning, deep learning, recurrent neural nets. So I really, I really like this result. I recommend you to also check this paper out. Um, and, you know, some examples of the kinds of things it does uh, it's, I mean, just to, so you, that you see the complexity of the task. There's very subtle dif difference between all these, but the third length um, obviously is lower when you do certain optimal permutations. And it, this is, this is a quite, quite a hard task for, for us to solve. And obviously, 100 cities is probably not what chip designers and other people might be interested in. So um, again, a very cool uh, and interesting area for future research. So another thing that has happened is we're trying to push more and more um, of the learning towards neural nets, deep learning, machine learning. So if you think about learning as an update rule where you have gradients and you update your parameters and so on, you can actually think of that as another neural net. And in fact, this, this is something that um, I believe Hogg Reiter pioneered or, or, or proposed a few years ago. And I believe Nando, who is talking next um, in the next session, will tell us more about. But in summary, Basically, you, everything you can think of learning nowadays, you should just try and learn it, and things might work out if you have um, enough patience to tune the hyperparameters as usual. Um, so this is a pretty nice trend. Um, obviously, it's very early days, so there's lots to do there. Um, so this is obviously um, like learning, uh, let's say, a neural net or architectures and so on. This, this, we, we should be doing more of this, um, especially as computational resources and parallel processors and so on get invented. Um, and then the last thing I, I wanted to talk about was in video games, there's certain video games where you have sort of short horizon decisions. Um, but so, uh, and this is, this is the first example. So I'm sorry if you don't maybe understand exactly about StarCraft. Um, this is actually StarCraft 1, and this is in fact, um, I mean, this is not my work. This is, um, there, there was a class at Berkeley in 2011 where you know, students 
proposed some algorithms to, to play this game. And this, this is not deep Q learning, this is Q learning on uh, SIFT like features because those were sort of the state of the art features. Um, so it, there in the left, um, to represent the state of a unit, you simply kind of bin the directions where enemies and friends are. Um, and here the objective is just to face each other and, and try to, to survive, let's say, or, or, or remain with more units than the enemy, right? So just by simply having this feature to represent one of these units, right? So there's friends and some enemies. Um, they evolved with Q-learning a policy to play this game. And this is fairly reactive, right? So, so this, this is not the aspect of this game perhaps that is most interesting. Um, but they sort of show if internet works, it works great. So th this is the blue after evolving the policy, and typically you, you get sort of better than the other ones who are like not, not so smart, I guess. Um, so you can see them sort of doing some policy about moving around, and it's not superhuman, but it, it's pretty good. Um, and this was, I don't think it's on archive, because I don't think putting things on archive was a, th a thing in 2011, maybe. Um, and this was sort of the project that actually got me more into recurrent neural nets. Um, and in fact, how I believe I introduced myself to Ilya, who was working at, on recurrent neural nets at the time. So, so the idea here was, can I take many games played by, by just players of, of uh, StarCraft, there's, there's certain replays you can see and, and reproduce the game, and can I then learn from these games um, sort of a language model of sorts which will predict what happens next in the game, right? So the game always starts with a certain state, and then it sort of evolves, but these things now are quite long-term, quite complicated, and so on. And it turns out that it didn't work so well. This is, this is not an LSTM, um, and these were literally 1,200 games, so not, not a lot of training, training data. Nonetheless, um, some of the things that the model learned look lo like plausible games, and the idea here was, can I predict what you know, the enemy is doing, and so on. And obviously now that we're coming back to, to doing like machine learning um, with games, and the StarCraft community has been, um, and the, 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 there's a, a bunch of people that actually have been really developing um, bots for this game and many other games. Um, we're hoping now that maybe with more data and so on, we'll be able to actually understand the game dynamics and how people play to optimally act. Um, and, and have a, a good strategy game that plays uh, StarCraft. Um, but of course, the first step is to put the environment and the data out, which is what we're working on currently. Um, and so just to summarize, I think the, the common challenge is, despite all these efforts to attain long-range memory, I think there's not a lot of evidence that this actually has happened yet. Um, there's certainly progress, but um, I don't think we can claim that we can memorize 10,000s of symbols in a book written in, a, in the way that we do when we ask for questions. It's a great uh, goal, perhaps the frontier of, of RNNs or one of the frontiers of RNNs. And certainly there is architectures. Um, one of them, for in instance, was this phased LSTM that was presented a few, a few days ago here. Um, and all sorts of other techniques to make sure we fight vanishing gradients and we have architectures that, that are able to integrate information over long time, time spans that may um, lead us there. Um, so with that, I, maybe we have some questions or time for questions. Um, also, we'll swap rooms. Uh, I think Hog Writer will tell us about that later, but I'll leave it for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, perhaps before we go to questions, I have an, an announcement uh, to make. We move at 4.30, we start again, we move to Area 3. Remember, recurrent neural networks, Area 3, it's downstairs. You have to move downstairs for the next session. Area 3. Uh, but uh, are there questions for Oriol? Somewhere there. Hello. Thank you for the great talk. I'll just stand. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Am I? Oh, yeah. Hello. Good. Okay, good. 
Um, you mentioned some uh, 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 a challenge is the long-term dependencies. Mm -hmm. What are some good um, benchmarks to measure that? Indeed, that that might be another challenge. Is oh, that's, that's I don't the challenge. I don't think we have an image net for recurrent nets that would be like the ultimate challenge. I think there's good tasks, um, baby language model, machine translation, um, and reading comprehension. But it is perhaps a challenge first to all of us agree on the way to test these architectures and um, new, new models, for sure. Cool. Thanks.